Hi, this is Johnny. I'm going over CalTPA cycle one for multiple subjects, and this is step one plan. And it tells you to do the planning before you do steps two through four, which is funny because um, they want you to plan before you actually teach. That's a good thing. Um, you're using one class of students as a focus for this instructional cycle, and you'll be working with focus students as well. So the first piece is um, getting to know your students. You want to work to find, uh, consult with your master, mentor, supervisor, your teacher, additional school personnel, and with families as needed to develop your understanding of students' assets and learning needs. Assets is highlighted here, so do look that up. All of the things that are underlined are in the glossary at the end of the guide, so as you need those, All right? Review, um, so what I'm suggesting is cycle one is all about planning and teaching with students' assets and needs in mind. As much as you want to think about the cool things you're going to be doing, the great lesson you're going to be teaching, the materials you're going to make for them, you got to put the students first. So that what the students come to, how the students come to their learning, their assets, the things that they're able to do, and their needs and interests are the starting place for all the things that you do. So all, whatever activity or whatever materials should always be framed by that first, and that's a big part of cycle one. Um, review student work and available assessment and survey data. Talk with and observe students to learn about the class's range of assets, including academic strengths and learning needs. This is one of the cases where you'll need to spend some time with your master teacher, your, your teach, the teacher who's mentoring you in your classroom, who should know about um, the students' assets and learning needs, but also have a sense of what community assets students have as well. So. Do remember that as, as one of the things you need to be paying attention to. Um, you will need this information to establish content-specific learning goals and then using the ELD standards as well because language is going to matter a lot in this. So be smart. As you learn about who your students are, keep in mind that you want to choose three who will be good focus students. So this is a consultation with your mentors again. Um, you need to have a student who's coming to English one other language, student identified with a learning need, IEP 504 or GATE, or a student who comes to learning differently than most. Um, just to be on your own side and take care of yourself, choose three students that you can imagine that give you some sense that you'll be able to write about and give some report on in terms of what they tell you, show you about their learning along the way. Um, and so the other part here, important note, gather information about student assets and learning needs in a professional, appropriate manner that protects students' privacy. So um, while you might collect contextual information by talking with students, only do so if, if supportive and appropriate for the development of the student. So there may be things you want to ask about where they're coming from, what supports they might get from their parents and such, but you have to be tender about who they are and what they would understand about that as well. And um, you know, being clear that you're just trying to find out about them so you can be their good teacher. All right. So let's go through the different kinds of requirements for this information. For the whole class, so you always need to think about it in two parts. There's the whole class, and that's going to be the three focus students. It will always be organized that way in the write-ups too. Description of student assets and learning needs. Prior academic knowledge. So refer to prior lessons that led up to yours. Refer to study of the subject in prior school years. That's one way to think about academic knowledge. If they've had a series of lessons before yours, if you're teaching the fourth lesson in a series of five or six lessons in math, what were the lessons that led up to this? You, could, you should also probably frame it in terms of the larger context. If it's all about geometry, what kinds of things have they been learning about geometry both in this year and in years prior? All right. Um, English language proficiency levels. Um, work with your mentor teacher to find this information about the, find this information in school files. Cultural linguistic resources and funds of knowledge. Uh, do look up funds of knowledge in the text so you understand that this is more than just what they know, but also what their families offer them, their community offers them as well. When teachers shed their role of teacher and expert and instead take on a new role as learner, 
they can come to know their students and their families of their students in new and distinct ways. A little bit elaborate there, but um, just think about it as you want to learn about where your kids are coming from. What can you learn about their home lives, their cultural, the cultural considerations towards teaching and learning, those kinds of things that, should, that the kids bring with them to your classroom. You need to be able to think about that and describe that. Um, and with this new knowledge, you can start seeing the households of students, that the households of students contain rich cultural and cognitive resources. And these resources can and should be used in the classroom in order to provide culturally responsive and meaningful lessons that tap into students' prior knowledge. So this is about using their funds of knowledge, and do look up the term, as something that supports students to move forward. Okay, Thinking about family and home as a resource for student learning. The last one being prior experiences and interests related to the content that you plan to teach. Um, this does not have to be school interests and experiences. Best if not, how does what you want to teach them connect to their cares outside of school? So there, you might be choosing an appropriate novel or something that has something to do with something kids care about. Um, and you might have trouble if you're teaching a, a novel that has no connection to your kids, that has nothing, nothing relevant to them. So do think about choices of literature. You might frame math problems in a way that matter to kids and where they're coming from, not just generic problems. So things that, that connect to kids. So the next piece, and this is all being the template, context information for the class. Um, all, of the, all, of the ablo, all of the below is important, but you won't be graded on it. But it will give you knowledge about who you are teaching. That's, what it, that, that's, that's why it's important. Okay, so do do this well. You will know all this stuff about your kids, and then you're teaching them. That's what you would like. And you can see some of the things that matter. And this is all work you do with your mentor, teacher, and perhaps the school secretary. The next piece is all about the focus students. The first one is description of three focus students and learning needs. You must choose three different individuals as focus students. And now we're going to talk about focus student one. Um, the guide asks you to refer to them this way, so do hold on to it. FS1, FS2, and FS3. Okay, so focus student one, choose a district identified English learner. This can be an English learner at any CELT LPAC level. Consult your mentor teachers again, or folks, or bilingual coordinators, or language coordinators at your school. If you have only one, only redesignated, if you have only redesignated English learners in your class, you may select one of them, or select a student who needs support for his or her language development. So this is going to matter to some of you that if you don't have kids who are identified as English learners strictly by these t tests, you can have a kid who's been redesignated, still working on English, or a student who's working on his or her language development. There's some latitude there. So the definition of English learner is not fixed. You want to choose a student who is coming to English from another language if possible. If it is a challenge to find an English learner, do what is suggested. Choose a student who needs support in language development in general. And that's a consultation that you need to have with your mentor and with your instructor who's supporting you with CalTBA. So these are considerations. Current proficiency in reading, writing, and speaking and listening, in English and mastery of the primary language, prior academic language related to the specific content, social identity, cultural linguistic resources and funds of knowledge, prior experiences and interests, developmental considerations. So you can imagine having a little talk with your focus student one to try to get an understanding of all of these things. So take this as a checklist. So A, B, C, D, three, all the way through F. You will have to address each of these in the reporting form you will submit. So don't think I'll do some of these and not other ones of these. Focus student two, choose a student taught in a general education classroom. So this is one who's just with you all the time, not pulled out for instruction during the lesson. So this is somebody who would normally be in that lesson that you are teaching, not one who would normally be pulled out. Um, and the district has identified as having a disability. 
with an IEP or 504 plan or identified with GATE as a GATE student. As I said before, this becomes trickier when you are working in primary classrooms because those designations might not be there. So you have to work with your mentor to decide which student would be most appropriate. If there are no identified students in your class, select a student who has recently been referred or, spe or for specialized support who requires additional learning support in the general education setting. And again, here's a checklist. What the learning challenge is, prior academic knowledge, this comes up again and again. Social identity comes up again and again. Cultural and, specific and linguistic resources comes up again and again. So make sure you have all of those, as well as these, prior experiences and interests and developmental considerations. For each of the focus students, a number of these are the same. So again, a checklist that sets you up for later writing. So as you're gathering that information, do use this as a checklist. Okay. And here is a, a bit about choosing focus student two in a transitional K or primary grade classrooms, as I was talking about. Select a student who has been identified for support through multi-tiered systems of support, who has recently been referred to for evaluation, or is or who is struggling in a content area. So you, this gives you latitude about what student you might choose for the second focus student. A lot of latitude. Focus student three, choose a student whose life experiences either inside or outside of school may result in a need for additional academic and or emotional support and whose behavior in class catches your attention. So this one has a lot of room. They're not identified in any particular way, but you're paying attention to them because they have an interesting way of coming to their learning. All right, and they give some definitions here. Does not participate, falls asleep in class, remains silent, acts out, demands attention. Life experiences may include, but are not limited to challenges in the home, community or school as a result of discrimination, bullying, illness, loss of parents, divorce, trauma, hopelessness, poverty, or incarceration, so lots of things, okay? Um, so again, a checklist down here. The difference um, is in this first one, as opposed to the other ones, what is it about their experience that make, has you identifying them as focus student three? The other things, prior academic knowledge, social identity, cultural and linguistic resources, prior experiences, developmental considerations, are like the other two focus students. Again, use it as a checklist. Okay, second piece is planning. So, use knowledge about your students to establish content-specific learning goals. Okay, what do you want your students to learn in this lesson? And develop one lesson plan. That's what's good about cycle one. It's not as elaborate as cycle two. You just make one good lesson in literacy or mathematics. Now, about this part about establishing content-specific learning goal, do make it s clear that you're setting out something kids can do, and there'll be evidence for what they've learned in that lesson. All right, so it might fit in the, in the largest scheme of things, but what piece of it can you say, this is what they're going to get out of this lesson? Set clear learning goals. This will matter in the reflection. Again, if you have clear learning goals, then as you're doing your assessment, you can say, yes, no, may maybe. The kids understood what the learning goal was and what were able to meet that learning goal. So be very specific about it. Just one lesson, not three, make it a good one. And again, math or literacy, and the other you will do for cycle two. Okay, you may use any lesson plan format. Um, so as that could be the format that you use in your program. Recommendation is to use the one they set out because in the lesson plan format template that CalTPA sets out, they ask specific questions about the three focus students, which really will give you grounding and set you up so that you can do the lesson that fits well for this assessment. Um, you also want to think about UDL. That comes up in the overview as well. So best to use their lesson plan format. Directs you to the things you need to focus on. What are you planning to teach in this lesson? Here's the checklist again. Content to be taught based on con California content standards. And then that's part of it. The first part is 
what you're teaching. The second part, content-specific pedagogy, is how are you teaching it? How are you being a math teacher? And how are the kids being mathematicians as they do their math lesson? And if you're doing literacy, how are you being a reading teacher or a writing teacher? And how are the kids being readers or becoming readers or becoming writers as a result of your teaching? Okay, learning goals. Um, and do think about ELD as you need. Where and how this lesson fits into the larger unit of instruction. What you expect your, learners, your students to learn and be able to do. And that should be a complete rewriting of your learning goal. So if you have a learning goal that sets out what you want your kids to do or learn from this, then you should be able to say what they will be able to do as a result of the lesson because of that. So what are you teaching? What standards does this address? What will students know and be able to do after this lesson? What are the learning goals? Again, connect what they are able to do to the learning goals. How this lesson matters to the scheme organization of the subject. How does it all fit in? Okay. And this next piece um, is about assessment. And this is all about checks for understanding. This is all the piece where you're going to purposely set out moments where you stop, you ask a question, you stop and visit a few students who are working in a group. You're visiting with them as they're working on a group project. And you check in, listen. Sometimes it's not about asking them things. It's just observing them. You might write about what you're specifically looking for. At this point, my students are working on this problem. I'd like to be able, I'd like, I'm going to be observing them and looking for these things. Okay, so how are you going to build in assessment along the way to check for their understanding? Keep in mind three possible assessments, all important. First one is check for understanding along the way, use good questions, observe what they are doing. The other two, Student self-assessment, have them tell you how they are doing. Okay, That could be thumbs up, that could be fist to five, it could be an exit ticket where they have a question like, how did you do today? What was the best thing you learned today? What do you feel confident in? And the last one is a closure assessment too, like the exit ticket, or a discussion. You could use class talk as a form of assessment too. What kids tell you about what they've learned along the way, those are all ways to get at assessment. And how will you structure student learning activities? So what are they going to be doing based on what how will you what are you going to put in the lesson plan that gets them to do the work for the learning? Okay, so they say here active, challenging, engaging, and accessible to support students. And they give you some examples here. Um, do look at those. And as I said, students must be doing the learning. They should be engaged with, and this is suggestions here, materials, ideas, each other. Do include a pair share or other shared work. It's really potent when kids are talking amongst themselves and you can listen in on them and you capture that audio on the video. Okay, and if you do a pair share, do have somebody moving the video recording camera close enough so that you can hear what kids are saying. Those are all ways for you to assess what's going on and know how they're doing, but also you, you, you're capturing their, their engagement, which is what matters. Okay, And how will you group students and manage group work? You have to have a rationale for this. If you choose to do them randomly, why? If you choose them to have paired in some particular way, if you choose to do pair share, what's the reason why? How will, your plan for, how will you plan your instruction to support learning through these student activities? Okay, instruction strategies to support student learning during or outside of the lesson. And they give some examples here. Okay, so I write, you will describe the purposeful activity you engage in to make the ideas comprehensible and accessible to students. Emphasize modeling, showing how, through think aloud or use of manipulatives. And I'm going to say this is a really, really important one. Okay, if you're doing a math lesson, you should be using manipulatives to show kids what they're, what's happening. But more importantly is this. As you're modeling, you're doing a think aloud. You're saying how you think about it as somebody who, who's doing that work. Okay, you can imagine it in writing. I'm thinking that my next sentence should be about this. And to start my sentence, I think I should refer to the main character. You talk out as you're teaching how you think about that as an expert other. So th think alouds and uses of manipulatives for modeling are very potent ways to do this part of the for the planning. Make sure you have those things in there. 
and um, you have to describe what educational technology and materials you'll be using as well as um, adaptations and accommodations um, that you plan for your kids. So be very clear in your write-up that you're making this lesson work for all of your students. So purposefully describe specific accommodations you will make for specific students. This, the big idea here is that you starting with knowing your students and you're making your lesson work for them. It's not about, I'll plan a lesson and I'll figure out later how to support them. In the, at the front end of your planning, knowing your students sets out the accommodations and adaptations you should be thinking about. The next piece, and this is one of the templates, is a lesson plan rationale. So think about the class context information and students' assets and learning needs for the whole class and focus students. Briefly respond to the following prompts, and that's part of the template, using the template provided to explain how the lesson plan is informed by, by and addresses. So each one of these is important. Again, you might make some kind of checklist for yourself. You want to have these in mind before you do the lesson writing. Again, you want to have these in mind as you move into the lesson plan. You don't want to have write a lesson plan, teach it, and then go back to this and say, oh, I should have thought about that. So prior academic knowledge, you want to build on students' prior academic knowledge. Um, so you want to think about prior lessons in the topic, prior study of that subject in past years. What have they done beforehand that sets them up for this lesson? Okay, Students' assets and learning needs. It incorporates or builds on students' cultural and linguistic resources, socioeconomic backgrounds, funds and knowledge, prior experiences and interests related to the, con to the content of the lesson. So funds of knowledge focus on what students bring to their learning. Again, this is all being positive. My students know about this. They're interested in this. They do this stuff in their recess because they like it. They do this at home. Third one, students, student learning activities. Explain why you selected the learning activities and how you engage all students. All probably should be underlined in higher order thinking. Okay, so you've got all students and higher order thinking. Okay, and descriptions of things that matter to higher order thinking. To purposefully advance their understandings of the specific content. And then you can see some of the things you might do. So these are big hints here. If you're doing a math lesson, manipulatives should show up. Both math and, and literacy think pair shares, models, drawings, maps, graphic organizers, performance, etc. All of these things are big flags saying maybe you should do some of these in your lesson. So things kids are going to be doing. An idea about higher order thinking, synthesis, evaluation, interpretation, transfer. Really, any kind of thinking that makes connections brings you to new understandings, uh, not rote memorization. Okay, kinds of thinking that leads you to other kinds of questions, it leads you to want to know more about things. That's higher order thinking. If we go to four now, instructional strategies, explain why you will use specific instructional strategies. Okay, this is you showing yourself as a teacher making clear choices to do right by kids, the kids you know a lot about and what adaptations you might make to improve student access to learning. Describe how you will support student engagement with the content you are teaching this lesson. Again, modeling, scaffolding, asking questions, providing instructions to guide an activity. All these things should show up into your lesson plan. Work with your mentor teacher to set out worthwhile instructional strategies. Model, ask questions, set clear instructions, purposely make time to support students while they are engaged in the learning activity. Okay, so make sure those are all built in. Under student grouping, rationale for grouping students, and you've got different kinds of ways you might do that, whole class, small group, pairs, individual, and the reason why, why does that matter? Group your students if it makes good sense to the activity, important. Set clear expectations for how students are helping each other in their learning through the group work. So just a word of caution, don't set them out to do group work if you're not sure they can do that well for themselves. You need it part of your responsibility for setting expectations is setting out the expectations for what they do in groups as well. Um, and then also take care with this one. Use pair shares or triads more frequently. 
So if you can, you don't have to do groups, but pair shares and triads will probably get, give you more for most things that you do. Just think of the logistics of organizing larger groups and how easy it is to do a triad or a pair share. Whole class for general explanations, modeling, small groups only if there is a clear task for them to accomplish. All right? Um, group work is often larger and takes more time to do things. If you're just trying to do a check for understanding or give them a, a moment to reflect on what they're doing, just do, a tri do triads or a pair share. Number six, academic language development. How will you address the academic language development needs of the students you are teaching? And this is including all of your students and thinking about vocabulary and terminology as well. Um, do go through the content beforehand. So. Um, if you have your teacher's manual or whatever you're using that you're referring to to set out your lesson, go through it with a language sieve. Go through it and saying, what's the language requirement here? How do I have to pay attention to language in this lesson? Make notes, put post-its in, in regards to all your kids, but particularly for your English learners as well. Do go through the content beforehand and key the terms and ideas that will need to be given attention during the lesson in order for your students to understand what's going on. Don't, you don't want to be in a situation where there's some important idea, set of words, a sentence or two that you hadn't keyed on beforehand and you share it with your kids and nobody gets a clue. You want to have known that beforehand by looking through the teaching materials and setting out a note for yourself saying, oh, I better stop here and explain this or talk about it or model it somehow. Um, two ways to give attention to academic language. Okay, a lot of focus on academic languages on vocabulary and definitions. The better way is to give attention to terms that matter during the context of the teaching. Stopping, defining, using the terms in the activity in context, checking for understanding along the way. So using the words as they need to be used and giving attention to them along the way as they're being used. Um, it's okay but not really enough to set out important terms early in the lesson and define them. If they're done that way, they don't have context or connection to ideas, and kids don't hold on to them quite as well. I don't think any of us do. Number seven, resources and materials to support learning. Explain why you chose particular resources and materials to support student learning and language demands in this lesson. What, are, what is the difficulty level of the text, materials, and resources needed for this lesson? Um, and how do these materials enable students to make understanding? And the last one, number eight, next one, number eight, assessments. Explain how the assessments check will check on students' understanding of the content during the lesson. Again, three types would be good. Make sure you do informal checks for understanding, stopping, checking, asking questions, pausing for a response, listening in on groups or pair shares, someplace having a student self-assessment. Lastly, closure, some kind of exit ticket discussion or quiz. Okay, so those are good ways to go about that. Number nine, developmental considerations. Explain how the lesson addresses the developmental considerations for your students. Discuss with this with the mentor teacher. And this is probably really, really useful because your mentor teacher should know a lot more about kids that age and the kinds of things that they do and think about when they come to that topic. Most likely the lesson you're teaching is one that your mentor teachers taught before and he or she knows what kids that age will think about and how they will respond to it and what things might be a little troublesome for them because of their age. So how does this lesson fit with who your students are in terms of their age and development? Number 10, explain how the lesson addresses individual needs of the three focus students. Okay, And then you want to make sure you have all these different things. Assist if you use assistive technology, kinds of inclusion um, activities, um, kinds of support that goes along the way. Um, make sure you address each of your three focus students separately. So like a paragraph for each of them, it's really important. I think you might get dinged if you lump them all together because the whole point is they are not the same. They're different from one each other. So make that distinction and be very clear and specific in, in how each one of them is being addressed in relation to how you describe them in your earlier work when you were getting to know them. Um, and a suggestion on that template is to start with your description of each and then plan your support and teaching for, them, for each. Okay, 
So say what you're going to do for, do for each of them. Next part, related instructional materials and resources. Okay, so submit no more than eight pages of, instru of key instructional resources. And these could be PowerPoints, assessment uh, assignments or directions, one paragraph description of text students read, etc. Um, and then there's a list of evidence to be submitted for this step one. First one is written narrative, getting to know your students. You need to know, again, as I said before, it's both about whole class and three focus students. You have your lesson plan. That could be the lesson plan provided by CalTPA. It could be your own. There's advantages to using CalTPA's format. Then you need to talk about your lesson plan through a rationale. And then you need to include instructional resources and materials as well. And um, let's see what I wrote about that. Okay, guidelines for these forms are elsewhere. So the forms themselves are elaborate, and we can talk about them another time. Again, this is your checklist for step one. So this is the conclusion of step one. I hope this has been helpful to you.